Hello, Emmanuel Presbyterian Church. Uh, it's my joy and honor to bring God's word to you, uh, wherever you may be, and in this season of life. Uh, today we're looking at the book of Isaiah. Book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Once again, as we are going through the entire Bible together, I want to remind you, uh, we want to see how God is working uh, here to bring the salvation, uh, bring the salvation in Jesus Christ. And now we're in the uh, prophetic books, prophetical books, and now we are here dealing with God's call to repentance uh, to his people, namely the kingdom of Judah and Israel. And then we also see God's judgment on his people uh, that for their lack of repentance and belief. But not only on his people, but also other nations as well. But at the end, we see a glimpse of hope in the future when God promises new creation, a new people of God. So with that said, you know, if you have any questions or concerns, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, I, I put my email, and my email is on the website as well, but email on the worship order. Uh, so with that said, at this time, let us go to God in prayer, and let us pray together. So children, close your eyes. I know I'm not there, but close your eyes and pray. God, we thank you for your word, which is an anchor to our lives. Uh, at this time now, as you speak to us, May it address our heart, mind, and our hands that we don't just receive it as intellectual uh, talk uh, or just as emotional um, a speech or just simply a law where it t tells us to do something. But then God, may our whole being be involved. And then so for those who are prideful, you will humble us. But for those who are afflicted and down, that you will comfort and give them confidence in you. God, we thank you. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us now read God's word together. <clears throat> uh, Book of Isaiah, chapter 43, verse 1 through 7. People of God, the grass withers, the flower fades. The word of the Lord will stand forever. This is God's word. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Amen. Amen. Growing up as a child, I hated getting discipline. I'm probably not the only one. Um, but as children, just growing up, uh, it, it, I, I hated it. I hated it because it was scary, and I didn't want to get spanked. It hurt too much. I vividly remember one time when I was getting disciplined by my dad in middle school. Uh, what happened was that my mom had asked me to help her, but I didn't uh, because I wanted to play with my friends. Then my dad told me to go to the mess bedroom with him. At the time I knew uh, I had done something wrong. As soon as we sat down, I was already crying my eyes out. And then he asked me, Sung, do you know what you did wrong? 
I knew. I did. And that's, that's what happens in this, when you discipline, that you are asked, you are asked, what did you do wrong? And what, have done, what, what has done, what has that done to the other person? What kind of hurt did it bring? And then here in, with the Israelites, that's something that they had to go through right before this passage in Isaiah chapter 42. In verses 8 through 25, we see that God tells them, you're deaf, you're blind, you don't listen to me, you don't see me, you don't, you don't observe what I do, you're insensitive, you're ignorant. And then for that, they will be looted and they will experience God's fire of wrath. Knowing what they have done and knowing what they deserve, they fear for the worst. They know that God's words are about to come. What will he say? And to their surprise, God speaks comfort to them. Like a good father, before and after and while God confirms his love for his people. Perhaps that's something that you need right now. Perhaps because you feel that you had not been doing well as a Christian. You're low, you're down. You have not been kept up with Bible reading. You have not been praying enough. You, you, you don't even worship. That you don't seek out fellowship. You don't, you're not evangelizing. You're not seeking to love your neighbors where you are. You're not being a good father, mother, or children. And in that place, you might feel that God has abandoned you or that God is angry at you. But today's goal through this sermon is that you will be comforted and that you will be confident. So here's the main point. Main point is that in spite, in spite of our sin, God comforts and gives us confidence in him by confirming his love for us in Jesus. Let me say that again. In spite of our sin, God comforts and gives us confidence in him by confirming his love for us in Jesus. And we'll look at this in two points by answering the question, how does God confirm his love for us? Number one, by reminding us whose we are. And number two, by promising to bring us to him, by promising to bring us to him. So number one, how does God come from his love for us? By reminding us whose we are. Here first, with the Israelites, God confirms his love for them by reminding them they belong to him. In verse one, we see that God says, hey, I created you. This is who I am. I created you. I formed you. And then here the word form, it takes us back to Genesis 2 when God formed Adam out of the ground with an intricate plan and with a, with a specific goal in mind. But not only that, it gets more intimate where he says, I have, and for I have redeemed you. It's not only that God made them and formed them, but he says, I, I, I paid price for you to make you mine. And then lastly, there's the most intimate. He said, I, I have called you by name. And he says, you are mine. He claims them, claims them as his own. He reminds them of this covenant relationship between him and Israel. Intimate, personal and at the same time, legal relationship. So even though Israelites were not faithful to God like a, like a cheating wife, God still says, you are mine. You are mine. The Israelites knew what they deserved and why they deserved it. They knew what was going to happen to them. And we said in verse 2, Waters and fire signify judgment. Judgment that would come in exile. 
And it was all because of their unfaithfulness, disobedience, and unrepentance. And it's not the question of if, but he says when, when that happens. And the Israelites thought that God was over with them like their forefathers when they were driven out to the wilderness. Knowing this, knowing that they're in fear that God has abandoned them, God comforts them by reminding them whose they are. In verse 1 through 4, God is saying, I know what you have done. I know what you have done, but I'm sticking by you. I'm staying with you. You are mine. I redeemed you. I will go with you and protect you. Do you remember who I am to you and what I have done for you? He says in verse he says in verse 3, for I am the Lord your God, the holy one of Israel, your savior, who saved you from Egypt. And he reminds them, you are still precious in my eyes. And you're honored, and I love you. So when you are exiled, God is saying, so when you're exiled, when you, are, when you have departed this promised land, stop being scared that I leave you. You are mine. You can't imagine the comfort and confidence that these words brought for the Israelites who are facing exile. Well, do you see that we need this comfort and confidence through confirmation as well? Like the Israelites, we are still tempted to fear that God will stop loving us or be angry at us or leave us when, not if, when we sin. We have to remember as Christians, we're no better than non-Christians. If we were to put before God our resumes, all we can put on our resume is simply our sin. What we do and who we are don't, don't make us any more precious, honored, and loved by God than others. Then how? Seeing that we need this comfort and comfort, uh, confidence, how? How does God comfort us now and give us confidence? We receive comfort by confirmation of God's love in this passage, Isaiah, Old Testament, because we know and believe how God ultimately fulfills this passage in Jesus Christ. If you look at Romans chapter 5, verse 8, I'm going to give you time to turn there. I, I, I'm not putting it on, on, on screen, but I'm going to give you time to turn there. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. If you're not turning there, just listen carefully. This is God's love for us in Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, but God shows his love for us in that here is a Underlining, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God gave us his son as the good shepherd who calls his sheep by, calls his sheep by name and then who lay down his life as the ransom for his sheep on the cross where he suffered God's wrath. All the while, we were still sinners. If God loved us while we are good, we were good, then we have every reason to doubt his love when we sin. But if his love doesn't depend on us being perfect, but rather on our perfect God and his perfect son and our perfect savior, then we can be sure and confident of his love for us when we sin as well. That we no longer fear that he will leave, leave us or be angry at us when we sin. 
people of God, do you think and feel? How, how do you think and feel with God now? In shelter in place, as, as this sheltering in place gets longer and longer, perhaps we're becoming more apathetic, perhaps we're becoming more broken and faced with our own sin. Well, if you're like me, well, do you feel like you have disappointed God because you have not kept up with Bible reading? You, do you feel like God is angry with you because you're not talking to him in prayer? Do you feel like God will judge you instantly because you have sinned and you liked it? You want to keep doing it. And also you have not loved others by saying or doing selfish and hurtful things. Well, if you feel and think like that, this passage, this message of the gospel is for you. In Christ, you belong to God. You are precious, honored, and loved. And God wants to confirm them with you. And here, he does that by telling you to remember whose you are. And let that give you comfort and confidence that God will never stop loving us even when we sin now. So God comforts and gives us confidence and by confirming his love for us in Jesus by reminding us whose we are. And then now is the second point. Uh, how does God confirm his love for us? Here he says, by promising to bring us to him. By promising to bring us to him. This is our second point. Remember that Israelites' fear was that God will abandon them once they go into exile. And if you, if you remember the promise that was made to them, it was, the promise was tied to the land where they were staying. That, so for them to be not in that land anymore, and then that God will desert them from the land, they knew that they knew that they were in trouble, and they, they were questioning, doubting, and fearing that God will forever abandon them. And they knew that they were being kicked off for their sin, just like going back to Genesis chapter 3, where Adam and Eve were kicked off from the Garden of Eden for their sin. So without God, they feared that they would never come back to the promised land. There was, they were you know, thinking, is there any hope now that they are leaving this promised land? And to that fear and guilt, God makes a promise to bring them. Bring them back. And then here, uh, the Israelites will be exiled. And we see uh, the fulfillment of this uh, only a few chapters later. The Israelites will be exiled to the east. And then I'll keep that in mind later. That will be important. Uh, they'll be exiled to the east by the Babylonians. But there's a glimpse of hope for their return only a few chapters later in Isaiah chapter 45 when Cyrus is mentioned. And you might be asking, who, who is Cyrus and why is he important? Well, if you turn to Ezra chapter 1, we see that Cyrus is the, uh, is the Persian emperor who will, order, who will order to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. So once again, you can imagine, as, as they were fearing God's abandonment, uh, th that he would desert them, uh, you can imagine the comfort and confidence that Israelites received in these in this words of God's love for them, that he will bring them back, and then he will be with them, as, as verse 5 says, fear not, for I am with you, that he will follow them even to the exile, and bring them back. This is a love that will not let them go. Well, how does this passage then now comfort us and give us confidence? We see that God's promise actually goes beyond this Israelite's return to physical promised land in the Middle East. But now it's expanding not, to, not just to the Israelites, but to Every nation. 
we said in verse 5 and 6, where people return from exile, they will return from the east. But God promises to bring back his people from all four directions, not just east, but from west as well as, well as north and south. And even at the end of and even at the end of verse 6, it says, from the end of the earth. And it's, once again, this is not just, this promise expands not just to Israelites, but to everyone. We see in verse 7, everyone, every nation. And then also, if you notice, verse 5 and 6 doesn't say to where. Where are they returning to? Where is God bringing them back to? There's no designated destination. So we see that it's not just going back to this land, physical land where the, where the Israelite used to be. But God is promising a day when there will be a worldwide gathering of his people. And it is not to a land, but it is, it is to him. So it doesn't matter where you may be, but wherever you are, God says, I will call, I will bring this people back to me. And then here we see that how, how does God do that? He will do so by calling them by his name. We see in verse 7, everyone who is called by my name. And then here we have seen in the book of Isaiah his name, Yahweh, just in verse 3, for I am the Lord. And then also if you remember from chapter 7, Emmanuel, God with us. And then if you fast forward to Matthew chapter 28, we see that this name is the name that all the Christians bear, the name that we are baptized in, the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then ultimately, this name of God is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, the eternally begotten Son of God, we are now, as if for anyone who believes and trusts in him, is now adopted as sons and daughters of God. That we were once who were children of wrath by nature, who were under condemnation, under his curse. And then, but now, because as we are called by the name of God in Jesus Christ, that we are now adopted as sons and daughters of God. And this is why we need not fear when we sin, even when we sin, because God will not abandon us. What we have, it is not the spirit of slavery, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 18, 8, verse 15, that it falls back to fear. But what did he say? But well, you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. So God is not calling perfect people to himself. We see that clearly with Jesus as well. People, people who thought that they, they had no need for Jesus, the Pharisees, Pharisees thought that they were all good, but then God says, I have not come for the, for the well, but I came for the sick. God is not calling people who, who are not, who are perfect. We clearly saw that with Romans chapter five, while we're still sinners, while we're still his enemies, Paul tells us, he reconciled us to him. So as you look at this passage, is there anyone, as, as, as you're considering this passage, you, you come to realize you have sinned against God and there's a need for, your, for Savior. God is calling you. God is still in the process gathering his people to himself. That it is the broken, it is the sinful who, who see that they have sinned against God, who, who know that they did wrong. God is calling them and he says, turn to me. 
I'm calling you now in my name through my son. Respond by faith in Jesus Christ and receive life in him. Turn to him. As for Christians, then we can be confident. We can be, we can be confident in him that even as now we sin, it's not that he's, we're, not, we're not to be more away from him, but we are to be closer, to come to him, to, to let our sin be exposed and to say, God, I have sinned against you. Please forgive me for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ. We're not giving penance again and again where God is still keeping tally. God is not saying, okay, Jesus died for you, so you are at now zero. But then the thing is, you must give me righteousness where you must give me, you, you must keep on building upon and then you must give me infinite. He's not saying that. He's not saying you're at zero. We're not back to where Adam is. Adam was in Garden of Eden. The Bible is clearly telling us as we're sons and daughters. It's not only that Jesus took away our sin, but then by faith, he has given his perfect righteousness. So now, even as now, even as now we, we have sinned, as God looks at us, it is as if we have done, we have never done anything wrong, but it is as if we have always done what is right. And that's called a double imputation, that Jesus takes our sin and then Jesus gives us his perfect righteousness. So it's not that we're giving penance again and again, that we need to be, just feel sorry again and again, that we will never measure up but that we can be confident that we will be with him in heaven one day because of Jesus' perfect life and his perfect righteousness. But not only that as Christians, that, that gives us the motivation and the strength and the power to reflect our father as his sons and daughters in our lives. One pastor wrote, your life as a Christian is to display the world, the goodness of God to people who deserve judgment. Your life as a Christian is to display the world, the goodness of God to people who deserve judgment. So where we are called now, family, church, coworkers, friends, school friends, and pe even on people on social media, to the people you talk to, can we show the kind of committed love that we have received from God? I remember hearing a story about a couple uh, where the husband, a husband had addiction to drugs. And then he, he always feared that his wife will, will leave him because of his addiction. But then the wife told him, saying that, you keep acting like you will do something and I will leave you. But his wife said, I don't have a plan B. I'm staying, I'm here, I'm with you. So she told her, I hope you really figured out how to put it together because I'm not going anywhere, no matter what. And that gave him the motivation to seek help and, be, and sober up. I mean, that's an extreme example, but can we, be committed, can we be committed together in family, in church, in spite of sin that is around us and in us? That as we hurt each other, that can we say, you know what, I'm not going anywhere. You have hurt me and I'm deeply hurt. I know it will take years to be healed, but... Can you still say, I'm here, I'm not going in anywhere, I'm staying? Because that's kind of the love that God has shown me. He stayed with me. He's bringing, he's bringing me back to him. He has not abandoned me. His love will not let me go. That it, 
We can. We can do that because in Christ we are precious, honored, and loved sons and daughters of God. Sons and daughters, it means that we're not going to get kicked out. God will not bring us and say, you know what, you have sinned, so get out of my house. God will not say that. As once, uh, once Christian, that we will always remain his people. But then he calls us to live a life that reflects him, life of holiness, and that one day will be glorified in him. So people of God, can we show that kind of committed love to where we are? And then again, you might say, oh, I'm not, I'm not where I should be. I'm not doing what I should be doing. Keep going back to this confirmation of God's love. It's not up to you. God's love doesn't de- depend on our perfect love for him or for others, but on perfect Savior, Jesus Christ, his son. The goal of today's sermon uh, was that you will be comforted and be confident in God, but not to be placent, not to be complacent, It doesn't mean that we can just go on and sin and and think that, you know, it's okay. God will still love me. No, that's not what it means. Don't think that, oh, everything is okay if I don't pray or worship. Don't think, that's not what this passage is trying to get at. Instead, is calling us to be sure. When we are sure of God's love, when we are confirmed his love, where he reminds us whose we are, and then we were reminded of his promise that he will bring us to him, that he will never leave us or forsake us. That's the ground where we stand and do what what we're called to do. So, people of God, be sure and be confident, be comforted by this passage that God has loved us while we're still sinners by giving us Jesus, the good shepherd who calls us by his name. And we bear the name in our baptism. And then we're looking forward to that day when Jesus will return. And then I will end with this. Even on that day when Jesus returns, that we, the day will bring, the day brings comfort and confidence. And perhaps you're thinking, you know, I, I gotta get my egg together and then I gotta egg right before Jesus returns. But as Christians, as, as who has believed and trusted in Jesus Christ, even when Jesus returns to come to judge the living and the dead, we can still have comfort. How? Well, how about Catechism uh, question 52 answers that for us. What com- I will end with this by reading of the question and answer. What comfort is it to you that Christ will come to judge the living and the dead? Answer. In all my sorrow and persecution, I lift up my head and eagerly await as judged from heaven the very same person who before has submitted himself to the judgment of God for my sake and has removed all the curse from me. He will cast all his and my enemies into everlasting condemnation, but he will take me and all his chosen ones to himself into heavenly joy and glory. Amen. Let us pray together. God, we thank you. We thank you that you have called us as your people, that we are precious, honored, and loved in Jesus Christ. That God, in ourselves and in our own doing, we know that there's no value that we're filthy with sin. But then God, thank you so much. Thank you for making us yours. And thank you for promising that you will one day lead us back to you completely, fully in heaven, where one day we'll be with you and you will be our dwelling place, that we will be your dwelling place. 
But for now, give us comfort and confidence. Remembering whose we are. Even times when we sin. God, thank you for Jesus Christ. Keep us in this season of life when uncertainties mount up day after day. God, may our hope in Jesus become more sure and sure. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.